Meeting on May 23rd, where we are here at UCLA. It's a beautiful day. Sunshine is shining. And we're about to hear a debate on climate change, formerly known as global warming. <laughs> the topic today is global warming on balance is catastrophic. And we have in parentheses a hopeful sign that we'll look at the positives and the negatives of climate change and global warming. Speaking first for the government will be Sydney, and after Sydney will come Patel. On the opposition, A L I O N A, and sorry. And following her will be Jennifer. And your timer will be giving you both physical and oral time signals simultaneously. Hello, my name is Sydney. And the Hi, Sydney. <laughs> the topic of today is global warming on balance is catastrophic, and we will be um, outweighing weighing the positive and the negatives. Before we get started, we need to define catastrophic and global warming. So we are just defining catastrophic as involving or causing sudden great damage or suffering. And we are defining global warming as the increase in Earth's average surface temperature due to rising levels of greenhouse gases. Um, this case is a debate of value, and the side that wins will be the one that demonstrates its value to more importance than its opponent, via the evaluation of positive versus negatives and advantages versus disadvantages. The extent to which global warming is harmful is the question at debate. The government side are arguing that global warming has a catastrophic event, effect on the livelihoods of humans. This includes the effect on human health, agriculture, and the economy. The criteria that this debate should be judged on is which side does a better job at showcasing that either the positives outweigh the negatives or that the negatives outweigh the positives. The government urged proof that the global warming imposes overwhelming disadvantages and is detrimental to the safety and well-being of humans. And the opposition has to prove that it is not catastrophic to the livelihood and well-being of humans and that positives outweigh the negatives. So, would you be surprised to know that global warming Kills, people, kills more people than terrorism does? According to the White House Press Secretary, John Ernest, there are many more people on an annual basis that die because of climate change, because of the spread of disease, than people who die because of terrorism. According to the international study by DARA, it contributed 400,000 deaths to climate change, but it only contributed 18,000 deaths in the peak year of terrorism. And over the 13-year study, only 100,000 people died because of terrorism. This isn't just due to heat waves or extreme weather for global warming. It's because of food security, nutrition, and water Bye. safety. So one of the main things that kills people is, because of climate change, is human infectious diseases. Importantly, salmonella is one of them. Because of the rising temperature, um, this makes it so that Sorry. The, uh, it influences these pathogens to have a longer inc incubation period. And these hot, extended periods of hot weather raises the average temperature of water bodies and food environment, which provides an agreeable environment for microorganisms. There has been an outbreak of salmonella, salmonella the leading cause of foodborne illness and death among mm -hmm. bacterial pathogens. There are over one million cases annually. And with this increase in temperature due to global warming, the ability of salmonella to resist environmental stresses also increases. According to data from the Maryland Foodborne Disease Active Surveillance Network, there was a 4.1% increase in salmonella risk associated with one unit increase in extreme temperature events. And in coastal areas, it's even higher, with a 5.1% per one unit of increase. In another study, um, in European countries, each one degree Celsius increase responds to a 5 to 10% increase in cases of salmonella outbreak. Because of all this, people are dying more because um, more because of salmonella than they used to before global warming had a heightened um, impact on the environment. Excessive heat is also one of the things that are leading to death. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, during the past 10 years, heat has been the number one weather-related killer in the United States. 
The National Resource Defense Council predicts that more than 1,500,000 Americans alone may, end, may die by the end of the century because of the excessive heat caused by climate change. In Texas in 2011, it's at the highest monthly average since 1895. And in the Midwest in 2012, it's at the same thing. Overall, the average since 1895 has been triple the long-term average for heat waves. Three. And this has, not, and this has un, been unprecedented since, the, since 1895. These um, hotter average days can lead to um, the increased levels of illness and amounts of death because it compromises the body's ability to regulate its temperature by introducing direct or indirect health complications. A decline in the ability to control your internal temperature can lead to a cascade of illnesses including heat cramps, exhaustion, heat stroke, and hypothermia in the, presen in the presence of extreme heat. And then also, also like aside from health, it also is catastrophic to agriculture. Um, plants have an optical, optimal temperature range that they are adapted to grow in. And according to the National Climate Assessment, large shifts in temperature can significantly affect seasonal biomass growth. While changes in temperature can, and intensity of extreme temperature effects are expected to negatively affect crop development. In 2000, in Michigan, this chilling, the number of chilling hours versus heat hours um, was 30% lower in 1950, and this led to an economic impact of $220 million in one year alone. If you think about this, like in one state, in one year, you have 220, $220 million in effects. So think about what happens in each state, in each country, how these all add up. Crops are not the only thing being affected by global warming. Livestock production is also affected by extreme temperatures. The, um, it affects the animal's metabolic, uh, it make, sorry, it affects the animals because they cannot control the body heat inside, which makes it, the metabolism also have to cope with all these heat stress, which makes it so that when we go to harvest these animals and do that, they are not, they cannot produce as much like meat or they cannot produce as much milk, which also results in more economic damages as well. And my opponents, well, no, what is One it? minute. Oh, now. You go to on balance now and say on balance and read your on balance statement. The effects of global warming are catastrophic to the livelihood of humans. The effects on human health, the environment, and agriculture cannot simply be overlooked. Human mortality rates have been rising due to global warming, and if that is not catastrophic, then I don't know what is. I now stand open. I now stand open to clarification and point. So. Clarification. Thank you. We'll now hear from three minutes. Aliana. Yes. Almost screwed it up. Am I good any time? <clears throat> you began by comparing global warming deaths to deaths caused by terrorism, citing that 400,000 deaths are currently linked to climate change, a number that is expected to rise to 600,000 by 2030. Do you know what the breakdown of these causes of the global warming deaths is? Yeah, so according to the um, NCAA, the global warming deaths are attributed to the diseases such as I mentioned, salmonella, and also to the heat waves. The Look at us out here. And the Persuade us. And the rising temperatures. Okay, because according to your source, the number of deaths attributed to both climate and carbon are estimated to rise from approximately 5 million in 2010 to 6 million in 2030. The largest cause is indoor smoke, which killed 3.1 million in 2010 and is projected to kill 3.1 million in 2030. This number accounts for the majority of global warming deaths per year source and is unchanged. In addition, the number of hot and cold deaths is 35,000 in 2010 and 35,000 in 2030, contrary to your second argument that the number of heat-related deaths will increase. So, my question is, if global Too warming nice. is truly catastrophic, then how can the number of deaths in these seeming, seemingly significant categories remain constant? Can you repeat the last video question? How can the number of deaths in 2010 and 2030 remain the same if global warming is truly catastrophic? Because already it is beginning to be catastrophic because of these increase in like, CO2 and the increase in global warming. I right now we'll later clarify on this more. But because of this consistency, it is catastrophic now. We're not saying that it's going to be ca even more catastrophic later, but it is catastrophic like now. It is a present issue. The second question I would like to ask is, again, about excessive heat. According to a 2014 study looking at the United Kingdom, I find, they found, and I quote, 
Heat-related deaths are far fewer than deaths related to cold temperatures. In absolute numbers, the gains due to fewer deaths with cold exceed the losses due to increased heat. End quote. Given that global warming can save more lives than it takes away, why can we label this as a cause for human catastrophe? Um, along with extreme temperatures of temperature raising, it also leads to extreme temperatures and cold temperatures, which would contribute to those deaths caused by um, lower temperatures. Correct, but it's saying that the gains due to fewer deaths, meaning that cold will, the, the rising temperatures in cold areas will save more lives, and the rising temperatures in hot areas will kill more people. So on balance, you're saving more lives than you're taking away. So therefore, do you think that it's catastrophic? I still believe it is catastrophic because looking in Texas and the United States, there have been more deaths due to the excessive heat waves than there has been due to these um, lower temperatures. 30 seconds. Finally, I'd like to address salmonella. Um, in your article, you referenced that coastal areas are most at risk. Um, in a different article, I found that there is an inability to predict salmonella, con salmonella concentration in Floridian waters, which is by the coast. So, if it, you can't predict if you cannot predict salmonella deaths in the regions that you claim will suffer the most, how can you use salmonella as an example of the catastrophe, catastrophe you claim faces the human race? Because of the temp because of it's looking in the United States, with the increase in temperature, can I, the increase in You may answer has already briefly. Corresponded to five to ten, five to ten percent increase in cases already. Thank you. Here we'll now hear the leader of the opposition, also known as Aliana, for a speech not to exceed seven minutes in length. Good afternoon. My partner and, her and I are here to debate that global warming on balance is not catastrophic. We will adhere to the same definitions presented by the government. This case is a debate of value. The side that wins will be the one that demonstrates its value to be more important than its opponent via evaluation of advantages and disadvantages. Global warming has been proven to be a consequence of anthropogenic emissions. However, the question of wh whether it is harmful is up for debate. We argue that while global warming does have an effect on the environment and human population, it is not a catastrophe. It is a manageable phenomenon that can actually be beneficial. The side that better exhibits whether or not global warming is, at this point in time, catastrophic as it relates to human life should win the debate. The burden falls to the government to prove, without a doubt, that global warming imposes overwhelming disadvantages and detriments to the safety of humans. I'd like to point out that global warming is a holistic issue that should be considered from an international perspective that includes all people groups. That is, emphasis should not be placed on one region over another, as that is an unfair analysis of the consequences that affect the global population. I'm going to cover three overarching arguments for you today. The first is that the causal link between global warming and catastrophe is weak. The second is that global warming is an issue that we can mitigate and adapt to. And the third is that global warming can actually be beneficial for certain groups. Beginning with the causal link between global warming and catastrophe, extreme weather events cannot be attributed to global warming. In the IPCC's last report, they noted a lack of increase in intensity or frequency of extreme weather events. Quote, there is low confidence in observed global scale trends in droughts due to lack of direct observations, dependencies of inferred trends on the choice of definition for drought, and geographical inconsistencies in drought trends. End quote. The same premise applied to flooding. They found low confidence <coughs> in that as well, and with tropical cyclones. Are you guys noticing a trend here? Because I think that I am. I'd also like to point out that weather extremes have not been surpassed for decades or Five. centuries in some cases. Let's look at California as an example. The maximum temperature in this state was recorded at 134 degrees Fahrenheit in 1913. The minimum temperature of negative 45 degrees Fahrenheit in 1937, and the maximum snow depth of 451 inches in 1911. My question to you is, if global warming is catastrophic, increasing the intensity and frequency of extreme weather events, why have these numbers remained constant for so many years? The economic impacts of global warming are exaggerated and not well defined. Models that predict these economic impacts vary over time and in the sectors in which they are conducted, so many of these models don't actually encompass all the pertinent factors, and that's a statement that IPCC has made. With these limitations in mind, the estimates range from a 0.2 to 2% decrease in GDP with an increase of 2 degrees Celsius in temperature. For reference, alcohol consumption in the United States in 2007 resulted in a 2.11 decrease in GDP. Now, I know that we're all humanities and comm majors here, but the math is pretty simple, right? The maximum range that the IPCC predicts as a decrease in GDP is at 2%.
but a 2.11% was taken away from our GDP due to alcohol consumption, which we know isn't going to change anytime soon. Next, global warming is an issue that we can successfully mitigate and adapt to. Renewable energy resources are a great alternative to fossil fuels. Wind energy has been growing, and improvements in technology, such as the use of 3D printing of blade molds, has enormous potential to help, uh, to help us grow from 39 to all 50 states using wind energy, according to the Department of Energy. Solar energy also has great potential for advance in implementation. Now, what about developing countries? Agroforestry is a promising solution for developing countries. And what is agroforestry, you may be wondering? According to the USDA, it is the intentional integration of trees and shrubs into crop and animal farming systems to create environmental, economic, and social benefits. A 2015 case study in Tanzania found that it was a viable option. They found that agroforestry solved the issues of soil fertility depletion, food security, shortages in fuel, fodder, and land degradation. GMOs are also a strong candidate for both global warming mitigation and adaptation, as organisms that are ideally suited to an environment can help increase yields and harvest. This is a widely adopted practice, as in the U.S., 94% of all soybeans planted last year were genetically modified. Add that to 93% of cotton and 92% of all corn, all according to the USDA. A study published in the International Journal of Science and Development in 2014 also suggests that GMOs will survive and promote afforestation, eventually reviving destroyed mountains and forests and processing noxious emissions such as carbon dioxide. Furthermore, plants could be modified to fix not only carbon, but also nitrogen. And I'd like to bring it home with the third point, that global warming actually yields benefits. And it can help by increasing crop yields and ranges. The IPCC report fails to include that carbon dioxide fertilization has a positive effect, such as increasing yield by 30%. And this is corroborated by the World Bank, which found that cereal yields actually increased by 18% in the 21st century. According to the IPCC's report, quote, the economic impact of these changes in crop production as a result of climate change is considered to be mostly beneficial to society as a whole, leading to decreasing prices for consumers. It also found that the negative effects of climate change on agriculture have been overestimated by studies that do not account for adjustments that will be made, end quote. So we're looking at projections that don't account for anything that we might do to help solve this problem proactively, which we already have begun to do. And this may lead to misleading predictions. And finally, global warming has the ability to aid developing countries. Global warming has been making the earth greener and increasing vegetation in the areas that may need it the most. A 2016 study published by Nature asserts that 70% of this increase in vegetation can be attributed to carbon dioxide fertilization. Global warming also has the ability to increase water supply to developing countries. One minute. A case study in Tibet published in the Global and Planetary Change Journal found that increased glacier runoff, excuse me, and increased rainfall runoff can bring water to this region that needs it. It also found that water supply from major river source basins is unlikely to decline until at least 2070, so it's not catastrophic. To reiterate, there is not a strong causal link between global warming and catastrophe. Second, it's an issue that we can mitigate and adapt to, and third, it can actually bring benefit to certain parts of the globe. If this is the case, then how can a phenomenon with weak causation, the ability to be successfully managed, and have a positive influence on certain parts of the globe, be catastrophic? That is what I leave to you to decide. I now stand open for cross-examination and points of further clarification. First question, I would like to go back when we talked about agriculture yielding, um, global warming yielding um, higher crops in agriculture. Mm -hmm. What can you say about perennial crops that rely on cold weather to create higher yield? Because in 2000, the number of chilling hours in regions went down 30%, and it resulted in 200, a 220 million um, economic cost in certain countries, certain um, states. Uh, my response to that is that I'm basing my data off of the World Bank and IPCC, and this is the information that I have and I find to be pertinent to the issue. Um, as for perennial collapse, I don't have knowledge on that, so I can't speak to that directly, but I don't find it relevant as we're talking about advantages and disadvantages. And if we can grow by 30% or by 18%, as we've seen already, then that far outweighs any damages that we might find otherwise. Okay, and also like that, you say like it's still, we can see how you yield, but what about you? And you're like not taking into account some of the other crops that one of the biggest one is maize now in the United States. What, um, maize has also gone down. Two right. minutes. Okay. Uh, maize production has gone down this, this year by um, over like over half because of these 
um, low potential changes. My yeah, response yeah, to that yeah. would be we can successfully mitigate and adapt to this issue. That was my second point. I think that if we make use of certain things at our disposal, such as GMOs, then we can successfully adapt these this maze and whatever else may be declining to our new environment in ways that we can actually help boost its growth. And um, as I said, 92% of all corn is already genetically modified. So if we increase that number and we really refine our science, then we can help increase yields overall over time. All right, going back to one of your first points about GDP, you said it can um, raise up, um, it can cost up to 2% GDP. But what about the, um, implementing all these actions where it can cost up 20% more GDP? Like it takes more than it actually um, benefits us. Can I ask what your source on that is? Yes, um, it's the Stern Review. Okay, um, I again don't have knowledge um, to this specific point, um, but everything that I read from the Department of Energy and from other sources and the IPCC has suggested that mitigation is it's possible to be successful and that we can implement all these strategies to help solve the issues that global warming may present. Um, so based off of my knowledge and my sources, I would say that it will ultimately help our society and help us um, increase yields and whatever else in GDP um, as the IPCC actually said that it will on balance help um, the seconds. economy when it comes to crop yields and GDP. Last question. When you talk about developing countries about how it actually helps them, but if you Look at the cost of implementing all these tools. Like you said, it costs around $107 trillion to implement um, the renewable energy sources, not just solar panels, but also saying about like deforestation and all of that. What do you have to say about that? Right. So that's why I presented the idea of um, solar and wind energy as a thing that we can implement here in the States or in developed countries. And in developing countries, there are other more simplistic and holistic um, solutions we can implement such as I said, agroforestry, which has already been shown to work in Tanzania and has the potential to work in other places as well. Thank you very much. The chair will now hear from the deputy member of the government for a speech not to exceed seven minutes in length. Hey, everyone. I'm Patel. And Sydney already mentioned the bar about the debate, and I would like to go directly into my three main points. Uh, first, is global warming directly affect your health? Second, is it affects a lot of ecosystems that and that can be catastrophic. And third, it, it adversely affects the economy. <clears throat> Getting back to my first point, climate change is a global process, and it has both local and regional impacts that affect communities. These effects are direct, and Sydney already mentioned the direct effects, like heat waves that causes millions of deaths. I'm going to focus on more indirect effects. According to NIHES, uh, rising temperatures and wildfires and decreasing precipitation will lead to increase in ozone and particulate matter, elevating the risk of cardiovascular and respiratory illnesses and death. WHO reports that in 2012, 7 million people died as a result of air pollution and they revealed a stronger relationship between cardiovascular disease, air pollution, cancer, and respiratory disease. In 2012, in USA, 2.5 million resident deaths were registered in the United States. It was the top three leading cause of death. <clears throat> now, children are more vulnerable and that's why they, are get, they get more affected due to these indirect effects, like air pollution. According to UNICEF, today over half a, billion of, half a billion children live in extremely high flood occurrence zones. Nearly 160 million people, uh, children live in high, extremely drought severe zone in vast majority of Asia. World Health Organization also says that 11 million children under 15 are in hazardous work environment. We should care about children because children are our future. Five minutes. The impact of the climate change are only just beginning and will likely to continue to be worsened over the lifetime of children of today's children and future generations. The decision made now will have the greatest impact on our children and future generations. Leading to my second point, why we should care about the microbial ecosystem. Because you have more bacteria in your body compared to your own cells, and that's why we should care about microbial biosystem. A study conducted in Yale, uh, researcher says that as the planet warms, essential diversity and function in the microbial 
world could be lost. They carry out this research. Uh, there's a bacterium called Trichoresmium, grows in a nutrient poor region in the ocean, and that uh, it, it it creates nitrogen gas, which helps fertilizing from phytoplankton to whales, and <coughs> was subjected to. Uh, uh, and then they took this bacteria and they subjected it to the warmer environment and see what, what in future it might predict. They found out that this bacteria went into reproductive overdrive and gobbling up phosphorus and other vital nutrients for marine organisms which are vital to all these marine organisms. This scenario leads to the extinction of the useful bacteria and other useful organisms that leaves a gaping hole into the food web. This can be catastrophic. The journal, ESA journal says direct and indirect effects of climate change in the soil microbial due to temperature sensitivity and carbon cycling processes. Small changes in temperature could lead in a large release of soil carbon back into the atmosphere. As a study published in journal uh, Nature detailing the devastating impacts on three mass coral breaching events uh, recorded in 2002, 1998, and 2016. According to nca.gov, habitat loss and a local extinction of fish and other aquatic species are projected from the combined uh, from combined effects of increased water withdrawal and climate change. Talking about the economy, of uh, flood floods, droughts, and other catastrophic events can cause damage of property and infrastructure. It will harm trade, transportation, agriculture, fisheries, energy production, tourism, and also causes mass migration that leads into increased num number of climate refugees. According to the Stern Review, which is 700 page uh, release from uh, former World Bank chief economist, Lord Stern, concludes that not taking action against greenhouse gases emission would cost 2% of the GDP, which would be like millions or billions of dollars, but delaying this action would cost up to 20% of GDP, which would be trillions and quartillions of dollars. <laughs> Climate impacts will affect agriculture, nutrition, <coughs> jobs, livelihood in poor countries. By 2030, crop yields loss could mean that food prices would be 12% higher on average in Sub-Saharan Africa. You can link that 12% increase in food prices leads to this poverty and leads to the deaths of innocent children. According to sciencemag.org, the model assumed that human activities could, would boost carbon dioxide level 75% from today to 2100. Total damage would cost $492 trillion globally. John Lomberg, a skeptical environmentalist, says mathematical models shows that the global warming in the, in the 2080s could increase the number of people potentially exposed to malaria by 2 to 4 percent, that is 260 to 320 million of 8 billion at risk. Invasive species cost to the U.S. economy are estimated at $120 billion per year, and not, uh, not acting against these greenhouse gases can cost up to $180 million billion, with a B due to droughts, according to the New York Times. And not to mention, talking about this cost, life, you cannot cost life. So there is no scale sessions. for that. And I conclude that global warming affects human health, various ecosystem, and affect our economy drastically. Hence, global warming is catastrophic. I'm not, I now stand open for cross-examination and points of clarification. Thank you very much. We stand close together perfect, and face the audience whom you're trying to persuade. Jennifer, rock and roll. Okay. You said that the data reveals a link between indoor and outdoor air pollution exposure mm -hmm. and Stay in the power stance, Jennifer. It's like that, yeah. And cardiovascular diseases and respiratory illness and death and air pollution and cancer cancer all have links, but how can you infer causation from this correlation as cancer and those other things are already deadly in themselves, and it's also accounting for indoor, not only outdoor uh, exposure? 
I would say we live in an environment where air pollution directly affects us and also indirectly affects us. There is no data to prove that, okay, whether air pollution affected uh, this disease or not, or maybe genetics. But for now, even scientists would agree with me that due to air pollution, you increase, the, you increase your chances of these cardiovascular diseases, respiratory diseases, and cancer. Um, and like you discussed, there's hazardous child labor in other countries, and that can definitely be detrimental to children. But don't you think that it would be way more effective to try to solve this issue, starting with the very root of the problem, the fact that children are in this labor, instead of automatically just stopping the war global warming, which physically probably isn't really possible, and also with the malnutrition of the African children, wouldn't it be easier to find a way to feed them instead of just stop the crops from growing? Yes, you're correct that there is a child labor going on, but think of it this way, instead of going and solving the problem uh, of child labor, what if we just take these hazardous elements from the environment and we eradicate them, so we act first on those kind of stuff rather than child labor. If we take the hazardous elements from the environment, we'll automatically uh, solve this problem that children will not die from uh, uh, you know, is already something Right. In the long term, I definitely understand that point. However, currently, I would say it's more of a catastrophe that children are doing child well, labor and they could die from those effects rather than right now trying to fix those effects. Um, so your source on climate change and human health states that climate change is anticipated to worsen all of the major climate trends in the U.S., but since climate change models, as I'll discuss in, my, discuss in my brief, have been historically inaccurate, how do you think anticipating this is possible? And how can a catastrophic event, by which our definition is sudden, uh, be anticipated? Yeah, so talking about the models, we also like predict past, right? Models are not just predicting about future. If we trust on the data that in past this data was right, then why not we just uh, assume we're not saying that 100% the models would be right, but there there are some uncertainty. But most likely, it will uh, it, it will be true, accordingly. Okay. okay. And can you please clarify the connection uh, that you have between marine ecosystems and a human catastrophe? Right. Uh, marine ecosystem. Uh, can I ask another question? Marine <laughs> ecosystem. If there is a because we all are connected. What is world is so small? We all are connected. If there is a loop, a, a, a hole in in food web, then we all get affected due to due to them. Thank you very much. The chair will now hear the deputy member of the opposition for a speech not to exceed seven minutes in length. Hello, I am Jennifer Giddis, and I am speaking for the opposition with Eliana. We do not deny that global warming is a delicate, nerve-wracking issue, but we must acknowledge the present, which scientific understanding about global warming fails to do. I am going to show you how the media exacerbates the issue by carefully framing global warming, how climate change models cannot predict a catastrophic event like global warming, and how global warming in the past and the present has benefited society. First, I'll discuss the role of media betrayal. Global warming is framed in the media as a definite threat. Instead of talking about ways that it could happen, we talk about ways that it will happen. Stuart Capstick from the Tidal Center for Climate Change Research explains how no one wants to be labeled as a skeptic, so everyone wants to fit in and people avoid questioning the science behind what we're learning. So I'm going to do that for you. Dr. Willett Kepton, a professor at University of Delaware for Science and Policy, explains how in news reporting on global climate change, small differences in word choice and phrasing can affect the likelihood that the reader will apply a misleading cultural model. Suzanne Goldberg, U.S. environmental correspondent, explains how the word global warming is associated with such emotional engagement and support for personal and national action. Communications researchers from Yale, Rutgers, George Mason University explain how partisans can easily choose information sources that align with their political predispositions. So the result is this, of this is that the fragmented U.S. media environment might make it increasingly difficult for policymakers and the public to achieve a mutual understanding and compromise on the most pressing issues of today, like global warming. I'm also going to talk about how climate change models that aim to predict global warming effects are not reliable. Greg D. Idzo, chairman of the Center for the Study of Carbon Dioxide and Global Change, explains that the first step in properly attributing a given extreme weather 
event to CO2-induced global warming is to obtain real, measurable data on that event <coughs> over a sufficiently long time period. Although this rule seems obvious, time and time again, scientists, Hi. politicians, and members of the media violate this principle and publicly intimate CO2-induced global warming influences. Um, extreme weather simply because climate models project an influence. These individuals don't recognize the basic truth that climate model projections are not of the same standard as real-world observations. In fact, model output is unquestionably far inferior. Climate change models are uncertain about the future effects of global warming. People often look at temperatures in terms of 17 years instead of 35 years or 70 or even more, but temperature trends are more reliable if you look at the long term. Short-term variance here is masking longer-term climate trends. Joy Spencer, climatologist and former NASA scientist, explained how temperatures have risen much more slowly than UN computer model predictions. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, acknowledges that there are many components to climate change for which climate scientists are merely making their best guesses. IPCC computer models dating from 1990 through the present have consistently predicted at least 2.4 degrees of global warming per century. Such a warming would require at least 0.24 degrees Celsius per decade, for which we should see at least 0.80 degrees Celsius warming since 1979. However, real world warming since then is occurring at less than half of that pace. Even ignoring the global cooling period from the 1940s to 70s, for global temperatures to meet IPCC's predicted 2.4 degree rise by late this century, global temperatures must immediately begin rising at a sustained 0.30 degrees Celsius per decade. That has never come close to occurring during our modern warm period, and the 2014 global warming policy just that is unlikely to begin happening any time in the foreseeable future either. Earth was also warmer in Roman medieval times. Scientist Leif Coleman, the head of ecology and environmental science at Union University in Sweden, did a study where he analyzed radiocarbon dated megafossils. He found that temperatures were way hotter in Roman medieval times today. Global warming in the past and present has benefited society. Overall, the benefits that have come with global warming way outweigh the costs. Environmental journalist Brian Palmer says the two factors that will likely determine whether a particular region will prosper or suffer as climate change progresses are starting temperature and adaptability. But for example, according to Inter International Panel on Climate Change, global warming could improve agricultural productivity in Northern Europe and there could be a significant increase in the area of Sweden and Finland to grow corn. People are often blind to the benefits of global warming because they don't view the topic on balance. According to Leonard S. Sklar from the Department of Earth and Climate Sciences at San Francisco State University, many people don't understand climate change and do not prioritize it in the right way. This is because there's a single global threshold that there's a catastrophic breaking point that isolates climate change as a distant and abstract threat. There's a lot of diversity among different communities in what constitutes a catastrophe. Acknowledging this diversity and its risk perceptions may open greater opportunity for collective action and emissions reductions and highlights the need for a more comprehensive approach to managing the spectrum of climate risks like Aliana discussed. Some people should have lived longer and can live longer due to economic and political circumstances, but that to me is catastrophic. Yet the initiatives undertaken to reverse global warming are forms of ecological modernization conducted by the combined technocracy of rich consuming nations. Ben Weisner, an earth scientist at University College London, says the fatal flaw in ecological modernization is that it never deals with the root causes, so it's never ending and perpetuating. We are representing an unpopular opinion. Global warming is an emotional topic, a topic that many, including our, our government, have debated vehemently. We do not deny that global warming is an issue, a dangerous one and a scary one at that. But as we look forward, we forget to acknowledge the present. Scientific understanding about global warming neglects the present. We have shown that it is inaccurate to claim that global warming is catastrophic today based on our agreed definition. We have shown that global warming has the potential to aid developing countries by increasing vegetation and agricultural yields and bringing water to places that need it the most. It is not, despite science, our right to impose draconian limits on third world growth through global warming regulations. Media organizations have exacerbated the issue by framing global warming as an unstoppable issue. And historically unreliable climate change models do not provide a solid basis to label global warming today on balance as catastrophic. Thank you. I now stand open for cross-examination and points of clarification. Good. Thank you. Uh, I have first.
question for you. What is media according to? Does it include television, internet, magazine, newspaper, etc.? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, come back to the second question. Do you agree that media show the negative side of global warming? That's what you said in your first one. I agree. I think that the media only talks about what could happen when global warming comes, but they don't take into account the fact that there is no solid, solid evidence to show that it will come. So I think the discussion should be, will it come and what can we do um, to prevent it or work towards it before it happens? And instead, they just say it's going to happen, it's a disaster, everybody watch out. Like, since we were little, I'm sure the first thing when you heard global warming, you've always known that it was bad before you even really knew exactly what it was. And then when you learned, you're like, oh, that's why, because we're predisposed to just know that it's bad through the media. Okay. So, uh, media sources like ScienceDirect.com, TNF Online, Washington Post, etc., to prove claim that the global warming is not catastrophic, can I say that you're contradicting yeah. yourself? Because you've got the information from media saying that global warming is not catastrophic. Right, well, mainstream media sources normally says that it is. However, the information that I provided, um, there was no really direct sources that said it wasn't catastrophic. They just gave me um, sufficient evidence to show that the points that I made that I'm showing why it's not catastrophic are correct. Okay, and it would be up to the um, judges to decide whether my evidence is enough or not. Okay. Uh, you mentioned another point. Climate change seems like a distant and abstract threat which is why people don't see it as a priority. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, and now, uh, like, I would like to say, if it's a distant threat, it, it is a threat, right? Oh yes, it's definitely dangerous, as I said. However, the word dangerous and the word catastrophic have very different meanings. Okay, so in, in your sense, dangerous cannot lead to catastrophic events. Oh, danger can lead to catastrophic, but you cannot infer One that a dangerous event will be catastrophic on balance 100%, you just can't say that. Okay. Uh, since you're talking about global warming, does any other country data shows that the global warming has a positive effect? Uh, as, you, as you mentioned in your point, Greenland and uh, Sweden uh, has a positive impact on global warming. Mm -hmm. Is there any other country in the world that shows that effect, especially the third world uh, countries? Um, yeah, plenty of other countries. Off the top of my head, I can't... Um, think of specific ones, I definitely have to research more. However, I will say that those countries, the UK is benefiting from it, um, Scandinavia, because they can grow more crops, there's definitely a lot of countries that are benefiting from warming. Okay. Um, yeah, one of the sentences, two, 222, uh, 22,000 children die each day because of 40. Can you help me link that with today's motion, is global warming catastrophic? How does that work? Briefly answer the question. Um, I mentioned that because uh, you and Sydney discussed ways that global warming are leading, leading to deaths, um, but you didn't really give us direct links to be able to infer causation. Um, so therefore saying that people die due to other reasons, reasons that are more preventable and that reasons that we can more actively um, push aside, uh, that's why I said that. Thank you very much. That concludes the constructive portion of the debate. And now comes the time for reputation. It's three minutes, right? It's three minutes. And we will first hear from the leader of the, of the government for a three-minute speech, which should include four parts. They said, I disagree because, therefore. Um, my opponents say that developing countries can benefit from climate change and that they believe that there are ways to mitigate the effects. However, we disagree because we believe that the negative effects on these developing countries will outweigh these positives. Since developing countries are home to most of the drylands on this planet, and drylands are home to more than 38% of the total global population, and they're one of the most sensitive areas to climate change and human activities, global warming will negatively affect these countries. Developing countries account for more than 70% of the global land area and population. So degradation and desert, um, desertification will become a challenge to the global ecosystems and human survival in the near future. My opponents also say that global warming can be um, we can implement mitigation effects to combat these effects of climate change. 
However, we believe that these mitigation efforts are too costly and have not worked. According to environmentalist Rachel James, he says, mitigation efforts have failed to prevent the continued increase mm -hmm. of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, and adaptation is now unlikely to be um, sufficient to prevent negative impacts of current and future climate change. Opponents also say that the increase in temperature would result in higher yields for crop production, but however, they fail to look at the global picture of every, of, um, they look only at some, they fail to look at the global picture. We believe that since major crops like maize, which is, she says has already, um, is already, um, already used GMOs, but they, these can still fail. Because of the heat stress, global, um, ma global maize production can loss, can double, the loss can double by 2080. What are we going to do when we do not have a, when the, we do not have enough food to feed all of our population? What are we going to do when um, people keep dying from malnutrition, even in the developing countries as well, when they are the ones who need it the most? Thank you. Thank you very much. The chair will now hear from the leader of the opposition for a three-minute rebuttal that should include four parts. They said, I disagree, because, therefore. They said. Aliana, take it away. I'm on it, all right. <laughs> She's on it. <laughs> they say that global warming deaths are far greater than deaths caused by terrorism, and we disagree with this comparison. Because according to their source, a self-defined opinion journal seeking to challenge the status quo the number one cause of global warming deaths, indoor smoke, a 3.1 million cause in 2010 and a 3.1 million cause in 2030, is not expected to rise, and neither is the amount of heat-related deaths, 35,000 in 2010 and 35,000 in 2030. Therefore, it cannot be catastrophic if there is no increase in fatalities over this time period. If they quote other data for this argument, that just goes to show the uncertainty and inconsistency of these catastrophic predictions. They also say that heat-related deaths will increase with global temperatures. We disagree because the data suggests otherwise. According to a study published in the Journal of Epidemiology analyzing temperature-related mortality in the, in the United States, heat mortality over a 13-year range increased by 3%, whereas cold-related mortality Two. increased by an average of 4.2%. I'd also encourage you to remember the study in the UK that found that on balance, the lives saved from heating up the colder areas outweighs the deaths that come from heating up the already warm areas. Therefore, on balance, we stick to our argument that global warming is not catastrophic. My, my opponent also says that global warming cannot be successfully mitigated. However, we disagree because we have seen examples, case studies in Tanzania in which agroforestry has been successful and in Tibet in which increased vegetation and water has been beneficial to the area that there are ways in which we can help developing countries and we can use things such as GMOs and um, other techniques to help mitigate and adapt to the issue in successful ways. If it wasn't successful, then why is the United States using 92% of their corn that way or 93% of their cotton? Therefore, um, we again say that on balance with all these pros and cons considered, global warming One is minute. not catastrophic. All in all, I encourage you to remember that global warming is a holistic issue that includes all of the world's populations in countries both developed and developing. Given the evidence both my partner and I have presented you, we believe that, on balance, global warming is not catastrophic, and we encourage you to consider that notion. Thank you. Thank you very much. The chair will now hear from the deputy member of the government for a speech not to exceed three minutes, with four parts of reputation, which uh, they said. I disagree because therefore. Okay. So they said that media only highlights that global warming is negative. I disagree because that cannot change the viewpoint of researchers and other educated people like you and me who has done research on this topic. People are intelligent enough to not get fooled by media. I would like to say that there is no proven facts of uh, proven facts that global warming is good in any way. Now, we have internet as a source of media and people in the world can get access to any unbiased information about the global warming. Therefore, I don't consider my audience to be fooled to believe in false information on important issues like global warming. They say climate change models that aim to predict global warming is not reliable. I disagree because the models are reliable due to advancement in technology. 
Their prediction is nearly accurate and precise, but not exact. Models are tested against the past, against what we know happened. If a model can correctly predict trends from the starting point somewhere in the past, we could expect it to predict with reasonable certainty what might happen in the future. There are some cases where the model fails, but that model, but that models are not being used in the later studies, or they are researched to become more accurate and precise. Therefore, I wouldn't question the accu accuracy of the models. They say that global warming has benefited the society in the past, present, and it will benefit in the future. I disagree, because there are gazillions of data showing that global warming has only affected us. It has potential threats to our health, like cancer, heart disease, respiratory disease, which are the leading cause of death, it has affected third world countries in many ways. All sorts of pollution, affecting transportation, agriculture, due to unpredictable climate patterns, floods, droughts, uncountable catastrophes, resulting into poverty and economical loss. In my opinion, One third minute. world countries will be in danger if they don't take serious action against this serious matter. It not only affects us, but it also affects organisms and increases their chances of extinction. And last, I would say that the audience is intelligent enough to understand. If global warming is not, uh, not catastrophic, businesses and many sectors are considering global warming to be real and acting against it. Let's say global warming is positive. We should plant more manufacturing plants, uh, assuming that carbon dioxide will be good for the future, and that would cause billions of dollars to save the life. Therefore, I conclude that the global warming has only negatives and no positives. This leads you to vote on the side who, who proved you that global warming is threat and threat is catastrophic. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but not least, we will hear from the deputy member of the opposition for her final rebuttal in four parts, which includes, he said, I disagree, because, therefore. They say that delaying action will cost 20% of GDP. We disagree. This is why we're saying that we do need to mitigate and adapt to this issue. We need to manage it instead of wasting time labeling it as dangerous or catastrophic or not. They say global warming in third world countries is solely negative and there are no positive effects. But on balance, which is what this debate is, I disagree. Like Aliana said, Tanzania serves as an example for the viability of agroforestry. As someone from South Florida who has experienced all of these effects of global warming, I could say that I have seen it be dangerous but absolutely not catastrophic. They say salmonella will increase. We disagree because studies have shown salmonella is negatively affected by higher soil temperatures. In addition, there is an inability to predict salmonella in Floridian coastal waters. If you can't actually predict something, it can't be catastrophic, and the same thing goes for models. I wanted to remind you guys of the word cat catastrophic, sudden. Despite what our opponents say about the accuracy of models, we we just cannot predict a sudden event, and that's why I believe that global warming on balance is not catastrophic. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now invite the uh, gladiators to cross the house and shake hands and congratulate their opponents on a very fine debate. And now it's time for the judges to individually, I repeat, individually make up their mind. Oops. <laughs> 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 
individual deliberation,